Okay, let me move on to the, the next of these topics, um, which also relates to uh, foreigners, invaders, if you like, um, but raises different questions. Uh, on the one hand, because we are talking about sentient beings um, very often, and on the other hand, because we are talking about cases where there is an impact on what you might say is the integrity of the existing commu biotic community, or endangering some particular species. So there are a number of examples of this um, that are mentioned in the reading um, and, uh, and elsewhere. And so here's, here's one example that is not really a problem in, in this country because uh, this squirrel here, the grey squirrel you're very familiar with, they're all over the campus. Um, but uh, somehow or other, I don't know whether anybody actually knows how, they got introduced to Europe, um, specifically uh, to Britain, but I think they're elsewhere in, in Europe as well now, uh, where the uh, native squirrel was this one, the, the red squirrel, which is a, a different species of animal, not only different in the colour, but slightly different in its physique. And it turned out that the grey squirrels um, do better in Britain than the red squirrels. So they've um, essentially driven out or out-competed with the red squirrels in the areas where red squirrels used to be the dominant squirrel, or the only squirrel, I guess, before the greys got there. And uh, red squirrels have been pushed back to the fringes of Britain, um, just places like Scotland, uh, where they, they're still surviving. But um, a lot of people in Britain think that this is a very bad thing that's happened. Among them is His Royal Highness Prince Charles, um, who uh, said this. This is a quote from uh, a British newspaper. Actually, I should have put the source, but uh, it's a relatively recent quote. Note the language that he's talking about. Right. Um, so the red squirrels, the British squirrels, are charming and irresistible, <laughs> and they're under ceaseless pernicious attack. So pernicious actually really seems to imply some sort of evil moral motivation to uh, the grey squirrels, but that's, that's not true. To the imported greys, you can see the kind of xenophobia going on here, they're imported. Um, and there is then at the end, there is an economic reason as well that he throws in. So you get the feeling that the animosity is related partly to the fact that the, our British squirrels are more charming than your American grey squirrels. Perhaps there's a certain amount of you know, this might be the only kind of anti-Americanism that the heir to the British throne could politically get away with. Um, so um, the question really is, you know, is there a, a good reason for saying that we want to have the, the red squirrels? Well, um, what's, what's being suggested here is not, in, in terms of doing this, is, is that we have to actually get rid of the grey squirrels. So um, grey squirrels have been declared a pest in, in Britain, um, and uh, you, can, you can capture them and kill them. Um, there are requirements that you have to kill them in certain humane ways, um, but uh, they can be captured and killed, whereas the red squirrels are protected. Um, and there are plans to try to restore them in areas, uh, try to sorry, restore the red squirrels by getting rid of all of the grey squirrels in some sort of more or less isolated forest areas um, and put, restock them with red squirrels taken down from Scotland in the hope that you can then protect them and keep out the grey squirrels from that area. Now to do that, there was a plan to do this in Cornwall where um, it's thought that because Cornwall, is, most of the forest is surrounded by sea, they'll be less prone to recolonisation by the greys. But the uh, animal rights movement has pointed out that effectively this involves um, killing thousands of grey squirrels who are already there and have established themselves in these forests. Um, they'll probably be killed by poisoning. Um, that's on a, if you're killing on a large scale, that's the most effective way of doing it. Um, it's not an instant death, um, but um, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not a... Terribly cruel death, for example, I'll give you a, in a moment, I'll give you a worse example um, with another species. But um, 
still, you're, you're killing thousands of animals um, of you know, somewhat similar type in order to restore the reds. And I think you have to answer, you have to ask, well, is that really worth doing? Is that so important? It's not as if reds are actually going to become extinct. Um, they, uh, it's, it's true that they are not in their previous range, but they seem to be hanging on OK in Scotland at the moment. And of course, there would be nothing to stop um, having enclosed areas uh, where you could keep the species going. In fact, the species exist in many zoos and wildlife parks and so on. So it's not really in danger of becoming extinct as a species. Uh, so the conflict here is between the, the death and suffering of uh, uh, large numbers of, of the grey squirrels in order to restock with the red squirrels, um, plus, I suppose, the use of resources that is involved in trying to restore that situation. And um, is it worth it? So here's a different case where perhaps the arguments are stronger. This is um, a photo <coughs> that dates from the 1930s taken in Australia of um, the introduced rabbit. And um, you can see in this photo, firstly, the density of the, that rabbits achieved in this particular area. Um, secondly, well, maybe you can't see it that clearly on this photo, but, but the field is basically being overgrazed to the point of, of there being nothing much on it. Um, and not surprising if it's carrying this density of of rabbit population. Um, so rabbits multiply. Um, they basically eat up everything. Uh, large parts of Australia are also very dry. And if you eat the vegetation that holds the soil together, um, then you get uh, uh, winds and drought. And essentially, you get a dust storms. And uh, the soil is getting carried away. So there's no doubt that they're doing uh, they were doing a lot of damage to, um, to uh, parts of Australia. And this, is, this was, of course, also um, important economically, not just in environmental terms, but this is probably land that uh, had been a sheep farm. And um, now, obviously, there's no grass left for the sheep because the rabbits have multiplied to a point where um, they've eaten the grass that the sheep would be, would be eating. And although, yes, you know, you can shoot and kill rabbits, um, commercially it's not uh, anything comparable to running sheep for, uh, for producers to get a commercial return. So um, what was done was the introduction of an exotic disease, exotic to Australia, called myxomatosis, which is a disease that is specific to rabbits and I think it was discovered in uh, Uruguay first. So here's a rabbit with myxomatosis. Um, it's a pretty horrible disease. These things are sort of basically sores or s that it gets on its skin. Um, I mean, there's the eye up there, and then there's one sore just below the eye, and there's another sore below the ear. Um, that's, uh, those lesions are just one of the symptoms. Uh, the rabbit is likely to go blind. It also develops fever. Um, it may become uh, it's quite likely to become lame. And the period that it takes after being infected to die varies greatly depending on the degree of resistance that uh, the rabbit will have. So initially, rabbits with no exposure to myxomatosis um, um, or uh, that are not descended from rabbits that have survived uh, outbreaks of myxomatosis, um, they may die in 48 hours. But um, Often, the disease will take much longer to run its course. And um, so the rabbit will become blind or lame, will not be able to get food, um, maybe not be able to find water, and will die of uh, eventually probably of dehydration or, or of hunger. So uh, this is definitely not um, a humane way of controlling rabbit population. Um, and it didn't, it wasn't. You know, it was somewhat successful in that um, the kinds of scenes that I showed you a moment ago um, don't really occur anymore. But um, what happens is you introduce myxomatosis and it kills about 90% of the rabbits. So population drops to just 10% of what it was. But those 10% of rabbits then breed. And why did those 10% survive? It seems like they have some genetic 
resistance to the disease. So they breed and their offspring have this resistance and the population starts to build up again. Um, what the Australian government then did essentially was to get scientists to vary the strains of myxomatosis and introduce new strains which would again have the effect of knocking the population down. Um, so um, myxomatosis is still occasionally around in Australia, although um, now it's, there are, there's a different disease called Khaleesi virus which has been introduced uh, which does kill them more quickly, so it's somewhat it's more humane than this. Um, but that problem is still an ongoing one, and in addition to the spread of disease, local farmers with particular rabbit problems will use things like poisoning um, in order to uh, control their rabbit population. So the cost in terms of animal suffering here is very high. On the other hand, the cost in terms of the degradation of uh, grassland of areas is also high. And um, there's another cost as well, and that is just as with the red and grey squirrels, the rabbit is a more successful grazier of these grasslands than this small marsupial called a bilby, um, which uh, is unique to Australia. And so um, there is the question of, is the spread of the rabbit going to cause the bilby to become extinct? Again, it seems the bilby is not actually going to become extinct because um, people have fenced off some areas to keep rabbits out of, uh, bilby habitat areas, and um, bilbies do survive in those areas, but it certainly takes significant effort. There are organizations that um, raise funds in order to protect the bilby, conservation organizations, and um, one of the things that they've done is they have urged Australians not to give uh, chocolate bunny rabbits at Easter because that promotes the idea that rabbits are nice and cute and cuddly. <laughs> and so they raise funds by promoting chocolate bilbies at Easter. This is the politically correct thing to give to give your children. So um, again, it's, it's if you like, it's um, an objection to what's exotic and uh, protection of what's native. Um, I think the, 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 the costs uh, are significant, and so I think this is a genuine dilemma, if you like, uh, about control of rabbits. But I think um, the amount of suffering that was caused by myxomatosis is very difficult to defend, and at least now we ought to be looking at other ways of resolving this problem. And at least in principle, um, we ought to be able to think of ways that either kill rabbits quickly and humanely, or better still, stop them breeding. Um, and there's been some research work on whether you could uh, produce a virus that, you know, like myxomatosis, was specific to rabbits, didn't affect other species, but instead of killing them painfully, would render them sterile. And that, I think, is the, would be the best solution. And if we really want to preserve some of the values that are threatened by rabbits, um, but uh, not inflict the immense amount of suffering that myxomatosis has done, then um, developing a, a, a sterilizing agent would be the solution. Uh, the problem, of course, is that you do have to make sure it's not going to sterilize anything else. Um, but because Australia's native animals are um, marsupials, with the exception of the, of the dingo, um, then it, it, you may be able to get something specific. The dingo, incidentally, is, is an interesting example in terms of deciding what's an exotic animal and what's a native animal. As I said, Australia's, uh, originally Australia's native animals were all marsupials. All, I mean, all of, the, all of the mammals were marsupials. Obviously, there were birds and reptiles and things like that. Um, the dingo was introduced, but it was not introduced by Europeans. It was introduced by Australian Aboriginals who came to Australia about 40,000 years ago. So the dingo is accepted as protected wildlife uh, as, as far as possible, um, whereas things that uh, Europeans introduced later on, whether it's rabbits or many other animals that have become feral, are uh, not accepted. Um, the dingo ob obviously also changed Australia's wildlife, um, but probably uh, those changes happened a long time ago and therefore we accept them. Okay, let's come back to Rolston because what we're talking about in some of these cases with the red squirrel or with the uh, 
Bilby, are things about preserving species. And so again, just as he talked about plants having value, even though they're not sentient, um, he wants to say something similar about species as such. And he's talking here about the species. He's not talking about the members of the species. So um, obviously, if the species is something like the bilby or the, the red squirrel, then each individual member of the species is a sentient being. But um, the species itself is not a sentient being. It's not even a being. It's, uh, you know, you can think of it in different ways. It's a, it's a concept, it's a classification. Um, uh, is it a natural kind? Is it something that exists naturally? Um, a lot of people think of that, that, you know, when we say something is of certain species, uh, it's not our imposition of a category on things out there, but that they are naturally different kinds. And, um, there are grounds for thinking that that is true um, in broad terms, but the, the definition of a species that's usually used is a collection of, of beings that are capable of interbreeding. And that's not, it's not quite so clear that that really does apply correctly to the definition of species. Um, there are, for example, populations of gulls which are um, where they're all recognised as, as uh, being of the one species, uh, but they actually can't all interbreed with each other. So you have gulls that um, in neighbouring geographical areas can interbreed with each other, and then let's say the one that's further west can interbreed with the one that's further west, group of the population that's further west with them, and they can interbreed with the next one that's west of them. You come all the way around the planet and you find uh, that they can't interbreed uh, uh, at the other end, or maybe in some cases they can, in some cases they can't. So to some extent the, the boundaries of what is a species are fuzzy. And of course uh, some people talk about, uh, want to talk about subspecies as being valuable as well. In the um, reading about, uh, from uh, Jamison about the case of the bighorn sheep in the Sierra Nevada, which were endangered by the increase in population of mountain lions when they were protected. Um, this is this is actually a subspecies of bighorn sheep, not a separate species, but people want to protect the Sierra Nevada subspecies. So if we're talking, you know, this, this is something of a fuzzy concept, but the, the question really is, can we talk about things mattering for species at all? Um, in, the, in the case of this, this passage here that Holmes Ralston is talking about, he's talking about species of plants, and he's saying, the well-being of plants at the species level outweigh the welfare of the goats on the individual level. So obviously the well-being of an individual goat is something real that we can talk about. It's a sentient being that can suffer. The well-being of plants, I've suggested we can't really properly talk about. They, they're not conscious. Um, and then the question is, well, what about the well-being of plants at the species level? Again, I think that this is really a metaphorical way of talking. I think you can give reasons why there is value in protecting species. You can talk about the value of diversity. You can talk about possible commercial value. You can talk about um, the Im importance for future generations of being able to appreciate various species living in their natural circumstances, whether they're plants or animals. Um, but I think talking about the well-being of the species is really confusing and um, doesn't, doesn't quite give us the idea of what is important here.